Nintendo 3DS. It was magical for being glasses-free 3D. And then people stopped caring about that feature pretty quickly. After the eShop shut down and the online modes had their life support pulled, it was finally time to acknowledge it was a goner. But the library it has will forever live on in our hearts. Especially if they get ported. Only one and a half rules. No remakes or ports. Which limits the number of contenders, as that was another thing this system was well known for. About half my library is basically those, but I wanted this to be for the game's design from the ground up. Alright, let's start it off! When Nintendo needed a hit for their, at the time, failing handheld, it's all reliable to the rescue! Not the first time we've had a portable Mario Kart, not the first time we've had a portable online Mario Kart. So what's so special about it then? You don't have to be first to be special. You just have to be good, and that's what we got. But you should still try to win. Great stages have strong ties to specific games, with many a fan favorites that started here, such as one of, if not THE best Rainbow Road, a great list of past stages, a solid battle mode with three different battle types, so yeah, it was pretty good. It even gave us gliding and underwater parts, which would continue into... a decade of eight! What were the problems then? You know how you would be on the last lap in first place thinking it's all yours, and then your fears manifest themselves into existence? We joke about that in just about every Mario Kart, but it has never felt truer here. And I'm just gonna say it, the roster and new items were lackluster. They belong in a who cares category. Still, it's the stages and solid controls that allowed this game to at least take the opening spot. It doesn't finish first, but it put in a good run. Ninth place. Kirby had one heck of a renaissance on the 3DS, but there's really only two choices to make. Forces of Nature, or Metallic Takeover. And Robot Invaders is just slightly my favorite of the two. It's seeing everything in a new model that just gives it that extra woo factor. Along with the reason that I just barely put it in the lead, Robobot Armor. This pink marshmallow is already a walking annihilator and we're just gonna give him more power? Can't think of a reason not to. Now, if it was just the Mech Rider, that would have been kind of unimpressive. But the suits can also copy a lot of the copy abilities. The old power-ups give us a new cone of paint, and they get a new way to be used. Getting in a mech and seeing a power-up makes you feel like you're about to open a present and see what you get. And I don't think there's a version I don't like. They also designed puzzle elements around this, so it wasn't just a power trip or gimmick, but a well-thought-out mechanic that blends itself into the game naturally. I'm probably saying what everyone else would casually say about this game, but I really do like the power-ups in Kirby, so it makes sense that this is what I will remember the most from this game. And that's not a bad thing at all, is it? Eighth place. I felt confused about a link between worlds for the longest time. And in all honesty, I really shouldn't have. It felt like a solid game in my eye, but at the time, it didn't leave much of an impression on me. Mainly just a been-there-done-that kind of experience. Still fun to play. Years later, I came to really appreciate the changes they made, such as being able to rent or buy all the major items right from the get-go, which actually makes the rupees worth collecting now. Your ammo and magic meter are both represented as a bar, and most of the dungeons can be played in just about any order you want, giving you a form of replayability, plus the ability to merge with the wall. How does this one mechanic get so many uses out of it and not feel repetitive? That's one puzzle I'm still trying to figure out. So what was confusing me about it for so long? Honestly, it's very minor stuff. 2D Zelda hasn't exactly been my favorite dimension of Zelda, and basically reusing A Link to the Past layout felt a bit lazy, even if it was a sequel. Uh, is that really it? Yeah, perspective. Otherwise, this is currently my favorite 2D Zelda game. Echoes of Wisdom might challenge that, though. Place. First up, let me say, I wish this game had a better soundtrack because it gets mind-numbing after a while. I get they wanted to keep things simplistic and in a minimalistic approach, but hitting that same note three times again and again makes me turn that volume off without a second thought. 
Especially when I need my thingy for solving these puzzles. You make more blocks of yourself for platforming, squeezing through other areas, blocking hazards, and more. You have a limit of how many you can make along with how many you can use before these crowns disappear, and those are the only collectibles here to unlock music, challenges, and costumes, some of which give you a little extra ability. The game just felt so original and combined platforming and puzzle solving in a way that made it its own. There are two more sequels on the 3DS and one on the Switch, but this is the one I've put the most time into and the most experience with. If only that soundtrack didn't sound like a metronome stuck hitting one key. Which is why I'm keeping this entry short. Well that, and I've basically already shown you what this game has to offer. Six points. I feel like I'm getting some mixed looks here. Well, get comfortable, everyone. I have a lot to get off my chest about this one, both good and bad. Starting with the right stuff. It felt like you were playing a PS2 game on a Nintendo handheld, which was pretty impressive at the time. The presentation makes it one of the best looking 3DS titles, and it runs better than it has any right to. The new mechanic flow motion is as much fun as it is broken. Tears through enemies or zip around the place. I can't think of a reason to not use it. And plenty of why I should abuse it. You have the cooldown effect that Birth by Sleep used for your specials, allowing you to use your abilities really easily. I gotta have Kieran Balloon on standby. And your Dream Eaters grant you special abilities and over-the-top attacks. In other words, the combat and exploration are fast, frantic, and fun! Sounds great so far, but this game is well known in the series for having its flaws be front and present. Not counting the drop mechanic, you know, the one everyone will point to. Because even though it's annoying to suddenly stop and swap to the next character, it is rather easy to manage as you can see it coming minutes away. The two things I will fault this game for are, some bosses might break you. If you haven't unlocked the right abilities yet, you better. And this is the point where the series went off the rails. I could understand nobodies, a fake anthem, the unverse, and everything up to this point, except retconning the nobodies to be pointless and time traveling. You just had to say, how do we make this convoluted to the point of no return? How in Nomura's messed up head does being a heartless allow you to go back in time to a previous version of yourself? How does that work? I get using Portals of Darkness to travel and that the Keyblade didn't choose Sora, but this? And retconning the nobodies to say they actually have hearts the whole time? What makes them any different from a regular person now? If Axel had a heart in Cage 2, then why did he fade away at that part? And if both the Heartless and Nobody are destroyed, then the original comes back, basically telling us that no one in this franchise will die! So yeah, the story started to become undefendable. Despite that, it's one of my favorite entries in this series, and I'll take that Dream Drop Alt and Smash Ultimate since nobody else will. Whatever the heck a Nobody is now. Fifth place! I begin with this one? Normally I would go over what it did to improve upon past titles, but this was the first one I played through and beat, so I'm not exactly the expert on the series. I don't know what tune-ups it had, or what it added. Other than the Dream World mechanic, you know, the whole premise of the game. So I'm just gonna treat this as I played it, and with the exceptions of the Dream Bed quest, tutorials around every corner, and basically requiring you to finish the side quest of saving every pilot in the game to be able to beat the final boss without grinding, everything else was fantastic! Engaging battles where timed attacks and counters keep you focused with high risk, high rewards. Every battle deserves your attention, and I'm happy to give it to them. Catchy tunes done by the one and only Yoko Shimomura, with Sacred Somnum Woods being a track I love to listen to when brainstorming ideas. Using the brother abilities for both platforming and coordinated combat. Dreamy World giving you different kinds of platforming and battles all together. The really big bosses that take up two screens! And I'm sure there's more to it, but it has been about a decade since I played it from beginning to end. It was the year to celebrate Luigi, and I got it with the model that had it built in! I was looking for an upgraded model at the time, and this came with it. Remember when you didn't have to worry if a special model came with a featured game? Yeah, I think I got a good deal here. Fourth place! Thank you. 
It feels weird to go back to this, but yeah, I remember spending hours on this before upgrading to the model with a better controller. Even today, with a better portable Smash, the only reason that I, and I assume anyone else would still play it, is for one reason. The best mode in the series that isn't solely fighting. Smash Run! Beat up classic enemies, run around and find power-ups, take on challenges, and duke it out with all those juicy power-ups you've earned! With the final battle always being a random challenge so you can't prepare for it, everyone feels equal. Unless you pick Shul, cause he'll get a boost no matter what. The enemies and treasure locations are always random, you can use your custom moves and powers, it's just so hard to put down once I start! That said, there is a lot of room for improvement. There was so much they could have done to expand on this, such as multiple maps, more enemies, add some boss room challenges, an online function, maybe even try to mess with your opponents on their end, as well as giving it online function! You know, just some ideas to think about. Sakurai does like to give us a reason why each injury is special, and this one? Well played, good sir. Here's hoping we'll get to see this feature expand upon in the future someday. Please rise for the National Anthem. I'll gladly say it, this is my favorite Fire Emblem game. And the last one I played. I just lost interest in the series going forward. It became too many too soon. But this was so good, it's all I'll need from the franchise! If it wasn't the story grabbing my attention, it was the characters pulling their own weight. Krom and company went through so many hardships, they pretty much had to fight through three wars in one game! And my army isn't full of cannon fodder. I have a group of people who feel real, with real conversations, who can really die! Raise it! Yeah, there's casual mode, but it takes away the sting and hook this series is known for. So does resetting, but the game likes to play dirty sometimes. It's a trial and error kind of feeling, and I just like to keep trying until I win without any casualties. I basically have to play with the mindset of play it one time to see what they'll do, and then a second time to counter that crap! I want a flawless victory in this game of chess with a rock, paper, scissors weapon mechanic and recruit anyone who might join our team. And my best weapon is a farm boy who started off super weak and became basically unstoppable! and went further beyond when he got a wife! Relationships and partnerships in this game offer great perks, from stat boosts, to both attacking the target, to the best one, protecting each other. This makes it feel like I've created a fully functioning and nearly invincible team! Some are maxed at the level of best friends, while others lead to marriages, and it's interesting to see which ones have great chemistry and the ones the writing team took a day off from. And the results bring forth children from the future who fight alongside you after you found and recruited them. A family that fight alongside each other, share victory together! Second place. What a comeback! Sakurai, you magical genius, you! What was once going to be a Star Fox game, turned series reboot that only got one entry, was amazing! I know others have this as their favorite, and I have no reason to argue, I just have something else I prefer more. This game respects what it was before, but only as little footnotes cause WOW! Is there so much going on in this game? You will be invested by the characters, you will be invested by what happens next, and mild spoiler, but who cares? Hades will make you smile and laugh every time he's on screen! There's lots of weapons to try out, secrets to find, challenges to overcome, references to get, and that online versus mode! Which is gone now, but hey, you can still play it offline! Sakurai really gave it his all for this one, it's just a shame to think that no one else will want to carry that torch. But you know, a Switch port wouldn't be that bad of a compromise. Really hope this doesn't die with a 3DS. A word of caution though for those who haven't played it, you might need to make sure it's a game you can actually play, as the controls may not be for everyone, but it's best to play for yourself and make that judgement. And make sure to get the 3DS stand and take breaks, otherwise the next thing that will need to be revived is your hand! Who to choose? Pokemon on a handheld is just too powerful for me! 
I can easily sink hours that can no longer be counted by the game. But which 3DS entry takes the top spot? Gen 6 didn't really get its chance to show us what it can really do. I was considering giving it to the Gen 3 remakes, but we have the no remake rule in effect, which brings us to Gen 7, and ultimately the best version, Ultra. <laughs> Gen 7, you were the point of the series where you decided to shake things up and for the better. Right, Pokemon, freed us from the HMs. No longer do we need a wasted six spot for cut, dive, etc. I enjoy Z-Rings way more than Mega Pokemon. Just about every Pokemon can use them, while some have special moves for them. Trials replace the gyms, giving trainers a different taste of challenge. And apparently the totem Pokemon get to order a double. Going from island to island actually gave it a bit more of an adventurous feel. It's hard to put into words, but just seeing an island on the horizon gave you the feel of, I can't wait to see what this one has to offer! We had the most pathetic team of self-aware losers, and that made them great! You became the first Alola champion, and you had to defend your title from different trainers. And giving your Pokémon extra proper care and attention can really pay off. This doesn't work against other players in the battle tree, but I'm not complaining. It'd be too broken if it was. And that was just a taste of what Gen 7 gave us. Ultra took it a bit further, while also making some minor changes. New Pokémon were introduced. You can surf to other islands and use the points you get from them for the move tutors. Ultra Necrozma can be one of the hardest fights in the series if you're not prepared for it. Ultra Wormholes allowed you to catch legendary Pokémon with a higher chance for them to be shiny. And you take on all previous team leaders, and they had the legendary that they were trying to capture. Woo! And I thought the games were jam-packed before. The story does show up a bit too much, and these guys were 100% shoehorned in. But I don't think there's a character here I don't want to see. They just felt like the places you visited. Full of life! It's not my favorite generation, but it's up there, no doubt about it. And that'll do for this list, and if you have a difference of opinion, I'd like to see your list of 10 favorite Nintendo 3DS games. Alola! And thanks for the memories.